frequent speaker at user assistance and tech comm conferences all over the world, founder of clickstart.net, a consulting company specializing in all things user assistance and design. I have learned so much from Scott over the years, and I'm so happy he's with us today to share his knowledge. So if you use images in your documentation, then this session is for you. Today is all about tips and best practices for styling, sizing images, adding captions, managing language specific images and more. So if you are brand new to using Flare or if you're considering adopting Flare to manage your content more intelligently or perhaps you've been using it for some time then I know you will enjoy this next hour and I'm confident you will come away with techniques you can use today. So welcome Scott. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, as always, since we have so much to cover, I just have two really quick items of business to talk about before we begin. Uh, number one, this session is being recorded. And so if you have to pop out early, not, to, not a problem. We're going to send everybody a link to the recording as soon as it's done. Um, and so probably in the next couple of days, we'll get that out to everybody. There's also a questions panel in the GoToWebinar console. We would encourage you to use that area to type in any questions you have as we're progressing through the session today. At the very end, we're going to do our best to get to as many as we can, depending on time. Whatever we don't get to, we'll go ahead and follow up with a question and answer document and get it out to everybody um, who has registered. So feel free to use that and don't worry if we don't get to your question, we'll, we'll certainly follow up with you after the fact. So with that, again, we have a lot to cover. Thanks again, Scott, for joining. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. All right. Uh, thanks, Jen. All right. So thank you uh, for joining me this morning or this afternoon, depending on where you are, maybe for some of you this evening. Uh, I am going to be talking about images. Here's kind of a quick overview. I've grouped the topics into a couple of categories. I'm going to cover as much as I can. This presentation is based on a presentation I'll be giving at uh, Mad World Europe in a couple of weeks. So if you're going to that, you can track me down and ask me more questions about formatting images if you'd like. All right, so first thing we're going to start with is how to add a drop shadow to an image. So here with our sample image, you can see it has a gray drop shadow. And the CSS property for that is box shadow. That's its name. And you get to control things like uh, the offset, so how far in from the left it is, how far down from the top it is, uh, the blur effect that it has, and of course the color. And that's what these properties are here. So as an example, the first one, you see it's moving it over. You can make it even more if you want. Moving it over from the left, moving it down from the top. And then this is sort of a how blurred is it and a stretch. And then we can change the color if you want to. Okay, so not too difficult to add a drop shadow. The problem with that is if you create a print target, uh, PDF files don't really understand what box shadow is, so it's not going to show up. You just won't have one. But you, you can come up with something that's similar to a drop shadow if you want to make a PDF from Flare. And the trick I usually use is to give the image a background color and then using the padding, padding bottom and padding right, if we add padding, then it adds a little bit of a gray around the outside, if, assuming the color is gray. And I can show you that. So here it is, kind of subtle. I could have added it. You know, it could have been bigger if I wanted. It doesn't get the cool inset and offset. It just goes to the edge. But it does have a sort of a drop shadow. It's better than nothing. So you can try that when you create your uh, PDFs from Flair. Another common thing that people like to do with their images, it's very popular, is to round off the corners. Now you can round off the corner or anything. It doesn't have to be an image. You see it a lot with tables. But for certain images, it does add a nice effect. And that uses a property named border radius. So as an example, we'll give it like an eight pixel curve. 
Okay, so it's curved, but if you really look at it, I'll make it even more curved, you can really see it. It's curving, but you don't really, it's kind of hidden there for the curved part, it disappeared. And that's because we don't have a border. There's no border around it, so we don't get to see any line around it. We need to add a border around the image. Okay, there we go. And it depends on how much of a curve you have. Even then, eh, it looks okay, but it kind of fades out on the edge. That's because my border radius is so big. If we make it have a thicker border, now it's starting to look a little bit better there. And this one will work fine if you create a PDF or if you're thinking, well, you know, what if my users print? So if the user prints, see it's there. Or if we make a PDF, it should work. So it just makes it a little bit more exciting, I think. Good thing to try out. All right, now we're getting a little bit trickier. What if you want to align the image? Now, they're going to be left aligned by default, but maybe you want to center the image or right align the image. And you, you have two choices. The interesting thing about an image in uh, HTML, actually a couple of interesting things about them, they have to be inside something. It's not just the image floating there all by itself. Normally it's inside of a paragraph, but it could be inside of, say, a div or whatever other tag you want. So it's a character level tag. It might, I mean, it's a big character. My sample one's big. It's not, you know, it's bigger than a letter, certainly, but it's treated like a character inside of something else. And because of that, because I said a character level, character level elements, they're not going to, you can't center them with text align. So I can't go to the image tag and say, hey, text align center. It's not going to work. The container element, like the paragraph, can be centered. And that's what I did here. There's a paragraph, of course, wrapped around that image. And it uses a class that I named centered. And then I'm using the, the standard text align center. So from a coding perspective, here's the coding. You can see this paragraph uses a class of centered. And that's how it's centered. And as we'll see in a second, you could do the same thing. There's left, center, and right. You could make this right aligned too if you wanted to. So you could change this as I'll show you. The problem with that is usually we have images and they're inside a paragraph. And the paragraph doesn't have a class. It's just plain old paragraph. So you can, it doesn't have a center class to say, hey, text align center. <laughs> um, now you could go through and find every paragraph that contains an image that you want to center and give it a, a style, but usually people aren't too excited about that. So if you're looking for something a little bit more difficult, but maybe a little bit easier to, to add if you have hundreds of images, let's try to do something to the image tag itself. Okay. So similar, but this time the centered style class is applied to the image tag. If we look at it. Here's our image, and you can see it has a class of centered. Now, from a CSS perspective, this is definitely trickier in order for this to work. Remember, I was telling you that character level elements like an image or a span, that's another common one, their display value by default is going to be inline. So what I'm doing is I'm saying, all right, I want to treat that image like a block level element. And then I can set margins and, and use text align and all that. So by setting it to display block, we could do something like that and that would, would center a block level element. So that's really the trick, making it act like a block level element. Uh, there, there's an interesting trick with this. I was telling you, we'll look at the right align. One way to, to right align a character level element like an image, you don't have to necessarily set the display to block, but this only works inside Flexbox. So I wanted to mention this because when you output 
content from Flare, this whole content area is is using Flexbox. And if something is inside a Flex element, little trick. setting the margin left to auto, pushes it over to the right. That's really Flexbox doing that. But since we are in Flexbox uh, from Player, you could try that as another option if you wanted to. Now, right align, like we talked about, P-tag, that's easy. If you want to right align all of your paragraphs, you could. Or if you put a class on this paragraph, then you know, whatever you named it, you could use text align right. If you want to write a line, the image tag itself, that's probably the hardest of all of them. I showed you one way to do it. If you can't rely on being inside of a flex box, then it's supposedly possible, but <laughs> yeah, we can do it anyway. All right, so the, the trick is float it to the right changes display instead of inline, inline block. And then the downside is whatever's below it, in my case, a paragraph that I typed right after, you can set it to clear. So the clear is saying, hey, stop floating. So a lot of work involved. At this point, you're probably better off just going to the P tag and formatting that because it's easier. But it's good to know all the options. Maybe in some cases this is the best approach for you. So that's it. Float it to the right. So it's displayed in line block. And remember, you've got to clear. Because if you don't clear it, everything below it's going to move up to this area here, which is not what you want. And it says a few things with our positioning. All right, some more troubleshooting. The width and the height. Width and the height are uh, notoriously <laughs> difficult to deal with, especially with images, especially if you're importing content. So just to give you a scenario, what if you imported content maybe from Word, and in Word you had inserted images, and most likely in Word you put the image into Word and you sized it probably because it was really big and you wanted it to fit on a piece of paper, so you made it smaller till it fit on the piece of paper. All right. The problem with doing that, sizing an image in Word and importing it or in Flare, uh, there's a little orange icon that'll appear on the bottom right corner, grabbing that and resizing it. Or maybe you even sized it in something else like FrameMaker. That's all inline. And it's very likely you have images with inline width and height specified. If we look at this one, you can see it. So this is what I'm talking about, that stuff. We don't want that there. So ideally, <laughs> this the literal image would be sized correctly. You wouldn't have to size with inline formatting. We just get rid of that. But if you can't do that, In your style sheet, you can use max width and max height. So if I know that the width of this image is 30 pixels and the height is 48 pixels, I can set it using max width and max height. Now you might be wondering why are you using max width and max height? Why don't you just use width and height? Well, the problem with that is that's what the image looks like by default. The problem with that, the inline formatting is going to win. So inline formatting, say, hey, you're going to be this big. And it looks kind of crummy. I don't want it to be that big. So if I have in my style sheet, hey, width is 30, height is 48, and the inline says something else, it's going to use the inline. Right? There's a lesser known trick in CSS. You, you might be thinking it now, like, oh, I'll just use my, my trick. I'll just put an exclamation point important. Now, you have to do it for both, unless you like the funhouse mirror effect. All right. 
You can do that. It's kind of sloppy, but you could do that. So what I'm recommending instead of that is if you know that this image is supposed to be 30 by 40, just put the max width in there. So if the max width is smaller than the specified width, max width wins, just like max height. If it's smaller than the specified height, max height will win. And that's what's happening here. So in a way, it's overriding the inline width and height that's specified. So that's a common trick that, that I use in my projects. Uh, another thing that you might want to use, this is something I use in pretty much every project, thinking about a print output. So when we create a print target like a PDF, if you have a really big image, like my Word example, same thing, you know, in Word, if you put an image in there and it's too big a piece of paper, Word's normally going to size it down to fit for you, but it's putting in inline formatting. If you think, oh, Word helped me, well, it, it helped you, but it put in inline formatting just to make it smaller. And you might have sized your images manually to fit the piece of paper, or maybe you've made a PDF from Flare, you didn't size them. And then you look at the PDF and say, wow, why are my images going right off the PDF? They're just chopped off. You know, they flow right off the right-hand side. That says they're too big. Well, a really, really useful trick for that. You don't have to worry so much about the height. So in your print medium, you can just set that guy to auto. Print medium, what I usually do for all my images, not just classes, but whole image tag, So I set the max width to 100%. This is one of the few places where I, I feel like CSS is, I feel like I got lucky. Like, wow, it's, it's actually doing what I thought it would do, but I didn't expect it to do. That's what I wanted, <laughs> but I'm happy that it worked. We're gonna see an example in a second where it does not do what you expected it to do. So the cool thing about 100% is it figures out when you make a PDF, the maximum width for the images. So, you know, pretending you're using an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper, got an inch on the left, inch on the right. So it knows how much space is left, six and a half inches. So 100% in that case would be six and a half. I don't have to type in six and a half, it just does that. If you have a different size page layout they use, then suddenly it's gonna be the maximum area that it has. So it automatically adjusts, pretty neat. Uh, it's only, because it's max width, only if the image is bigger, is it going to squish it down to fit? If it will already fit, it just leaves it as it is. If you're going to use this technique, of course, make the PDF, look at the images. You're letting CSS resize the image. It's going to resize them proportionally because I said max height auto. So it will scale it down correctly. But you might not like the quality of it. So assuming you like the quality, that's a really fast way to get your images to fit in print. Just put it in your print medium. All right, another common thing we fight with, with sizing, is percentage sizing. I was just telling you about max width 100% and how it's smart. It figures out the maximum width, say, of the piece of paper, and it's based on that. Well, <laughs> Online, percentage is the percent of the width of the container. I think a very fair assumption, I bet everyone probably assumes this, I certainly did, is that if I go to an image and say width 100%, what I'm doing is saying your width should be 100% of your actual width, the image's width has nothing to do with how wide the image is. It's inside a paragraph. It's how wide the paragraph is. So this paragraph goes from the edge to the edge. So if I say, hey, image, width 100%, it's gonna take up the full width of the paragraph. Ugh. What we think about typically with width 100% is I want you to be 100% of your actual size. Oh, there is a way to kind of do that in CSS. You have to 
have to be patient with it, tweak it a little bit. It's not a width though. It's a, a CSS property you almost never see. But I want to show it to you. So another CSS property that lets you resize an image based on the actual size of the image is called, it's a, one of the transform options, scale. It's going to tie into what might seem a little odd about images. Remember, images are considered a character level element. So as far as the browser is concerned, when you scale it, it scales out from its middle. I think, I, at least I expected it to scale from the top corner. So if I said, hey, you're going to get bigger, it would just grow this way diagonally. And I kind of expected, hey, if I scale you, then everything below you will move down. <laughs> That's not what happens. So the, the tricks involved here, I told it scale to be 20% of its original size, so 1.2. I'm adjusting it with this translate that I'm going to show you. And I had to change display from inline to inline block. So let me show you why. Right? If I leave it as inline, that's the same size as it was. That's the original size. So it didn't even scale at all. Inline elements can't scale. So inline block lets it scale. Uh, before I was changing the display to block. Well, that's going to freak it out. It doesn't move down the other content. And see, it even moved on top of this content. Because remember, it's scaling from the middle. So everything grew from the middle, and it's overlapping what's above it, overlapping what's below it. Now, there are times when we have an effect, like you have, you see this sometimes, you'll have a little box, you hover over it, and the box gets bigger, and then you move your mouse away and it gets smaller. But, I mean, that is what's happening here. It's growing from the middle but that's not what I wanted to happen to my image. Now, what's going on with this translate? The translate is also tied to the fact it grows from the middle. If I take that out, you'll see. See, it, it moved over to the left, too, because of the way it grew. So these translate options, one of them I'm using to move it over to the left, and one of them I'm using to move it down a little bit. Now, how do I know what to put here? Experimentation. That's, I remember, I did say you have to be patient. So once you decide, hey, let's make it 20% bigger, set it inline block, look at it, figure out where it's off. Is it too far to the left? Is it too far to the top? Is it too far to the bottom? And using these translates, now just kind of figure out which one works the best. It's not that elegant. But it is a way to scale an image based on its original size, if that's what you need to do. This width and height aren't going to do it. <laughs> They're going to size based on the width or height of the container that the image is inside. All right, well, what about captions? I know a lot of people have captions for their images. And you have quite a few options for captions. I'm going to show you the three most common. What I would recommend for these, it doesn't really matter so much which one you use. I would look at your existing content. If you already have captions, then you're already using most likely one of these three options. Might as well just stick with it. Probably not a big reason to change one of the other ones. But if you don't have any captions, or maybe you don't have any content, and you're thinking about, hey, we want to have captions, then you can pick which one you like the most. Or there, there will be subtle little differences between them. But you can get them all to behave. So the one I, I see the most often is just this idea of, hey, I want to have a paragraph above or below my image. And in that paragraph, I'm going to type a caption, which is what I did here. And if we look at it, 
I just made a class of the P tag and named it fig caption. You could name it whatever you want. So it's just like a normal class of P, nothing really unusual about that. And that's fine if you want to do it that way. Now, some newer things, newer option. When HTML5 came out, they did this great analysis they, using Google and, and everything. They looked at how people actually use, were using styles. And they kind of realized, wow, people are, everybody's using this workaround. Everyone is doing this because we don't have a tag for it. So let's gather all those up together as potential new tags we might add, make sure that they make sense. And they kind of whittled down the list and added some new tags in HTML5. And the one I'm about to show you is a new tag they added. What they realized in their analysis is a lot of people have captions for figures. And we don't have a tag for that. You can, people were doing exactly what I did here, making a, a class and naming figure caption or fig caption. So they thought, well, yeah, that is, you know, a unique type of content. It would make sense to be a tag. So there is now a tag you can use in, in Flare, or, you know, HTML in general, named fig caption. And if we look at the code, you'll see the difference here. So there is a fig caption tag you can use. And you can format it just like a, a class of the P tag if you want to. You can even use it with this cool figure tag. Now, if you are start, you know, brand new, you're still adding content to Flare, you haven't really done anything, you think, well, I don't have to redo anything. We don't have anything yet. I might lean in this direction because this is where HTML is going. The idea of having a figure tag with the image inside of it and the fig caption tag. So you're more planning for the future if you go this way. But as I was saying, if you already have existing content, if you're thinking right now, I have hundreds of images and they all use our fig caption style class. Are you saying I have to change it all this? And I am not saying that <laughs> at all. You can see what you're doing. Nothing wrong with doing that. But the reason I'm kind of leaning this way is they're obviously going to add new features to this and add cool things to it. There is a caption tag in HTML for tables. So instead of fig caption, the tag is caption. And it's in Flare. You may have used it in Flare. And a cool thing that you can use with the caption tag for tables, it has a style property that says, hey, put the caption above the table or below the table. So they, we could do that with fig caption too. Say, hey, move above the image or below the image. If you're doing it as a class of the P tag, it's going to be a lot harder to move it. Maybe with some jQuery, you could have it dynamically move. But most likely, if you have a big meeting and to say, hey, we're going to put all of our figure captions above the figures, and right now they're below them, probably <laughs> you're going to have to go through and cut each one and paste it above every image. Not really that fun. So that, that could be a cool thing here. Another interesting thing that's happening with the images I'll mention with the figure tag is they're, they're adding some really cool things where you can specify multiple image sources. And, and the the idea of the use case would be, well, what if I have kind of a big version of this image I want to use on big screens? And then if someone's on a tablet, I want it to automatically switch to a, another image that's smaller. Now, it even could be a different image if you wanted to, but let's just say it's the same image but smaller. And then even for a phone, hey, on a phone, switch to even smaller version image. So you could list out multiple sources but you've got to use the figure tag to do that kind of stuff. And like I was saying, I'm, I'm sure there'll be other things too. So that's why I like to lean towards what they've already added and what's coming up. All right, the third one, third way you could do this, 
is using what's called a pseudo element, an after pseudo element. Uh, if you've used CSS before, maybe you're familiar with the after pseudo element. There's before and after. There's quite a few pseudo elements, but two common ones are after and before. And after and before lets you add things before, in this case, say, a paragraph or after it. And if you want kind of an example of something you might have seen before, a, a really popular thing in Flare a lot of people like to do is maybe you're setting up a note style. And in Flare we have MC auto number format is a style property. And it can add content, usually before, it can add it after. But usually before something, let's say a note, and you want all your notes to automatically add the word note. So usually in Flare using MC auto number format, we go in and say, hey, every time I have a note, add the word note before the actual note content. Now behind the scenes, it's going to use before to do that. It's a little bit harder to set it up to use before, so that's one reason MC auto number format is a little bit better to use. The other reason is, that yeah, some I'm about to take advantage of, before and after, especially in older browsers, are not going to be well supported. And typically, when we output to PDF, they're not supported. PDF's not very smart with CSS. So by using MC Auto Number Format, we're putting all the work back on Madcap, and we're saying, hey, you, I want the word note to be there. I don't really care if somebody has an old browser, and I want to make PDFs. Make it work. And if you use before, well, then it's up to you to make it work. I'm not going to waste my time making it work. Madcap can make it work for me. So the trick I'm taking advantage of here, you can see this does not have a figure caption. I'm tricking it and saying, hey, in print, I want to use after for the image. Images don't normally have before and after. I, I mentioned kind of at the beginning, images have kind of two interesting features to them. I've been talking about one of them. One is that images are treated like character level elements, like a span or like a letter or number within a container element like a paragraph. Just kind of interesting, not because they're kind of big. We, we think of them often as block level elements, but they're not unless you set their display to block. But in HTML, you can't cheat, at least in this example. So just because I said, hey, the image is a block level element, in HTML, it's in the standard and in CSS, it is very clear that images, even if you say they're going to display as a block level element, cannot have a before and an after. It's not allowed. It's not only are they considered a character level element, they're called a replaced element. So what happens when the browser gets to the image, it says, ooh, I gotta put an image here. It keeps loading all the rest of the content and goes tracks down the image and kind of plops it into that spot. So it's already dynamic. It puts it in there. It doesn't loop back later and say, oh wait, now that I put the image in there, now you want me to add something before it, or now you want me to add something after it. So it doesn't do that. You can put in after and before pseudo elements all you want for image. They're not going to work. But <laughs> in the print medium, when we output to PDF, that's just HTML being difficult and saying, being stubborn. Like, hey, I don't care. Even if you say the image is a block level element, which normally could have before and after, I'm still not going to let it work. When we output to print, it will work. <laughs> so I said, hey, after it, how about we add some content and make it bold and green? Make sure that displays as a block so it's below it and not to the right of it. And what I did to make it even more powerful, when I add the image, I add all text. So the image has, has all text. 
which would appear for a screen reader, so when listening to the screen it would say the alt text, I'm reusing that alt text as the actual figure caption. That's what this is doing here. So if we look at it, figure caption example was added as alt text for that image, and it automatically shows up like a caption here in the PDF that I created. So I'm taking advantage of a trick there. Normally, pseudo elements are written with two colons. That's why I wrote it with two colons up there in, in the, uh, the heading. In older browsers, when they first added pseudo elements, they used one colon. So for older browsers, you have to use one colon. Newer browsers support one colon and two colons. So if you want to be techy, yes, it's supposed to use two colons. But if you want to support older browsers, you need to use one colon. And remember I was telling you, PDF support for CSS is <laughs> lagging significantly behind. So for PDF, you need to use one colon. If you use two, it's going to ignore it. Let's go ahead and use one colon in this situation. That's why I did that. Not a mistake. Okay, so that's just for print. And I find that useful because I work with a lot of groups that say, yeah, we want figure captions in print. We don't want them online. And then also, <laughs> they usually say, are you saying I have to re I have to type it twice? I got to type in the caption and you you keep harping on this alt text for screen readers. So I got to type it in both places. Well, using this trick, no, you do not. Just type it in as alt text and we'll just reuse it automatically in print as the caption. So not too bad. All right, another common thing that I like to do and a lot of people want to do, what if you have some images and you want to put something on top of them? It's usually the word draft. I mean, it could be whatever, confidential or something. Okay, so using draft as our example, we have an image. And any of my images that are actually draft, I apply to the image a draft tag. This draft condition here. Sorry, class, there it is. So there's draft. So if, if an image is draft, I tag this paragraph as draft. So I don't want every image to have it. And then I'm positioning it. and then telling it, hey, I didn't want to have to type the word draft, so I'm using my trick again. I'm saying, go get the name of your class. I named the class draft. So it grabs that, the word draft, from the class name and just puts it on top of it. Now, the name of my class is draft, all lowercase. I thought it looked cool or all uppercase. So I used text transform to make it all uppercase. And we size it, I made it red, and then the top and left. The way it's positioned is I told the paragraph, the paragraph uses the draft class, I gave it a position of relative. So the container element has a position, it has to have a position, and then inside of it, draft after, I said position absolute. So by default, the word draft is bound by this image. It's, it can move anywhere it wants around inside of this image. It's going to start with position absolute right up here in the top corner, top left. I didn't want it there. I wanted it centered. So I'm centering it relative to this top corner. So I said, all right, move down from the top. 50% and move over from the left, 50%. Calc is a new function in CSS. I'm telling you to calculate where to put, I didn't have to type in a number. I didn't have to figure out, oh, the image is this tall and this wide. Okay, half of that is this and type in the absolute number. 
This would work with any image, doesn't matter how big it is, it calculates how far to move it down. Now, why did I put in this minus here? Well, if you don't have that, remember that it is two rims tall. So without that, it's not factoring in the actual letters themselves. It's got to take out half of that. And then the left, it depends on how wide the word is, but you can see without adjusting it because of the word draft. So I moved it over. So this one's depending on the actual word. And this one depends on the font size. Half of the font size would be here. Okay, so that's getting in the middle. Now maybe, yeah, I mean, you can make a bigger or different color if you wanted to, but, but maybe you think, oh, I don't like it in the middle. I want to position somewhere else, or I want it to look cooler. Okay, we can, we can change it. I kind of like this one. Now, what if you want it in the bottom right? You want to have a background? Looks pretty neat. Okay, so we could do that. Remember that we have to set the position to say, hey, I want to move things around on top of you relative to where you are. So by putting in relative, position absolute, we're starting right up here in the top corner. Now, where do we want to go? We want to go down in this example to the bottom right. Now, I could have said bottom zero, but I wanted to move it in just a little bit. I wanted to go off the edge. So I moved it up just a little bit in the right. But as an example, I mean, you can put it in any corner you want. If you want to move it over to the bottom left. Sure. And the top. You can take out the zero in this case. Sure. So you can hit any of those corners if you want to, if you like this one better. And if you were to create a PDF, Yes, it would print. You don't get background colors. There's a trick for background colors. It's outside of images, so it's not covered in this presentation. But you can trick it to show at least a grayscale version of a background color. So that's why I don't see the red, and that's why it made it gray. So you do keep that in mind if the user prints. The print from a browser normally ignores background colors. All right, and then thinking about, hey, I want to make a PDF, and I like this cool overlay, and maybe you only want it to show up in your PDF. I'm using that same trick, taking advantage of the fact that you're not supposed to be able to do this, but when we output to PDF, it allows it. So we can't normally use after for an image, but when we use print medium, we can. And if we look at it, I just put it in the top corner, but you know, you move it around wherever you want. I personally think the bottom right one is kind of the most exciting, but I found a lot of times there's important information in the bottom right. I feel guilty kind of covering it up, but I, visually I kind of prefer that one. I've been leaning more towards this one in the top left, just because we know people read. They are going to start up here, so immediately they see draft. It's kind of hard to say, oh, I didn't realize that was a draft image. Well, I mean, it's right there. As soon as you look at the image, it's really eye-catching. So you can decide what you prefer. I, I've given you all the options. All right, let's talk a little bit. We'll kind of flip around now. I was talking a little bit about print there. What about some online-specific things? Well, something I would definitely consider in your projects is setting up responsive images. It's not too difficult to do it. I was talking about the figure tag before, and remember in the figure tag, there is a way using a source set to specify different images for different sizes. So to have a totally different image, say for desktop, tablet, and phone size. And sometimes that's the best approach to have, now you could have other sizes, but let's just stick to those three. But a more a flexible option is setting up an image to say, okay, 
I want you, when the screen is small, to dynamically get smaller. Not to change, you know, I don't have to make three different images and say move between these three at these set sizes. I want you to scale down relative to the width of the screen. Right? I was telling you about something that scales based on its container element. Remember, that's what these percentages do. So really the whole secret here is just saying max width 100%. In just a second, I'm going to resize the screen. And you'll see that the image dynamically gets smaller. Uh, I would think about a minimum. And it, it could be image dependent. But you know, at some point when the screen's really narrow, you don't want the image to keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller. You can't even read it anymore. So at some point you have to say, look, if you're on a tiny screen, it's, you know, two inches wide, you're gonna have to scroll left and right to see this image. I, I can't make it even usable at that size. So you'll probably want to specify a min width. Now what I did for my min width is I said, all right, when you get down to this break point for the phone size, just stop getting smaller. If somebody has a screen smaller than the width of a normal phone, then tough. You're going to scroll. So that's my, and I normally use a min width, if not this one, right around that amount. But you can decide what works best for you. So if we resize it, okay, so we're still okay. It's still desktop size, but now we're getting, see how it's resizing. And then eventually when my screen gets really narrow here, then it's done. It's like, all right, I don't care. <laughs> From here on out, tough. That's as small as I'm going to get. And so you can put that in for every image because the min could be the same for every image and certainly the max could be the same. So that's just one thing you can drop into your style sheet and your images would resize just like this one. Okay. The other thing I wanted to put in here as far as online goes is a lot of people, a homepage design is really popular right now. The cards or tiles, if you want to call them that, on a homepage, most people have those. And it's it's hard to have kind of a cool card or tile design. It takes a fair knowledge of CSS to put in something cool. But it's a it's one of the few places where we can have something exciting in our content and people kind of expect it. It's, you know, it's kind of a way to show off and get the user's attention. So I, I was out on the web getting card ideas, working on a project, and I found one I kind of liked. I wanted to put it in here. I tweaked it a little bit, adjusted it so it would work with Flair. But I, I think it, it it's a good balance of, it's a cool effect. It looks kind of neat. But I think it's also useful. So just to give you a, a cool one, you don't have to create it from scratch. Okay. So this idea, these could be products or whatever, but you have your products and then, you know, with a picture. And then if someone wants to is interested in one of them, they hover over it, see it kind of flips over, gives you a description. And then they, I didn't set it up, but they could click on it and then go to that product's landing page. So this is kind of a, a flip card effect that you could use for your cards if you want to. Now there's a lot of CSS going on with this, but you could, could use my example as a starting point. Everything I've shown you, I'm ga I've gathered them all up, and I'm going to make something you can download and have all examples. So if you're thinking, well, you know, I missed that. What was that again? It'll all be in there, and you can, you're can. you more than welcome to use any of these in your projects. And I'll show you in a second my email. You can always email me with questions. So don't worry. Everything I'm showing you, you'll be able to reuse in your own projects if, if you want to, including this one. So I'm not going to walk through all the CSS. It'll take quite a bit of time to talking about this one just to show it to you. It's a good bit. But it's using the same concepts that we talked about. There's a float to help position it, a transform, that's how it's flipping over. So when you hover over it, that's what flips it, this transform. 
box shadow, which we talked about, had a little bit of shadow to it. So it's all the concepts just taken, <laughs> maybe to an extreme in some ways. All right, and the last thing I wanted to talk about is just something I've been experimenting with. I'll give you the, the situation. Uh, those of you that might be going to Mad World Europe, uh, the session that this is part of, I'm going to cover images, these tips we've been talking about, lists and some tips for formatting bulleted numbered lists, and some CSS tips for localization. So thinking specifically about images and localization, a challenge that I'm often facing is Usually in my projects, the source language was English, so we rewrote everything in English. We've had the content translate into another language. In my example, it's going to be German. So the content has been translated, but they're still working on the images. So trying to manage that. You know, ideally, what, what we normally say is, all right, in the German version, as soon as we have a German version of the images, I want it to show up. And if we don't have one, I want to reuse the English one. So I wanted a way to automate that, to say, okay, let's start out with all the English language images in the German project. And we'll have a German images folder, which initially would be empty. And as soon as the page loads, how about it can go look in that folder, and if it finds a German version of the image, it shows it. And if it doesn't, it just defaults back to the English one. Uh, this isn't necessarily a, a trick I would, you could, but I haven't used it yet so much in the, the final version. It's more that we use during development, and we can see that, like when we send out drafts more and more, in my example, the German images are showing up until eventually they all show up. And it doesn't have to be language specific. That's where I've used it the most, but I have used this with versions too. Same concept. We finished version one. We're working on version two. The whole interface has changed. As we update the images, we put them in that version two folder and they immediately swap out. Okay, so let's use this JavaScript, but just to show you a live example, I'm gonna send you the script. It'll be part of everything else. This topic is marked as being in German. And it dynamically went to that German folder and loaded the German version of the image. Down here, there's my same boring image I've been using. That's the English version. There, We don't have a translated version of this image yet, so it rolled back to the English one. So just to, there are other ways to manage the images, but usually managing the translation of the images when they're happening over time, uh, it can be kind of tedious, it takes a lot of coordination. Potentially you could automate it, as I've been doing. All right, so if there are any questions, I might have time for any, maybe a question or two. Yes, thank you, Scott, that was wonderful. Um, we have some amazing questions coming in. I'd encourage you guys, if, if you have any that you haven't typed in yet, feel free to, to jot them down. Before we get to one or two, there's just um, one thing I'd like to remind everybody is if you could pull up the webinar deck. Thank you, Scott. So Mad World, you know, Scott mentioned it. We will be in Dublin. Uh, Scott will be there as well, October 8th through 11th for our learning conference, some great sessions and workshops. Uh, Scott talked about what he's going to be presenting on, uh, which will be extremely helpful. If you haven't registered already, um, please check it out. We'd encourage you to look at it. Um, you know, we do have some spots left and it's coming up. So if you haven't already registered, we'd love to have you there. Some amazing presenters, some great sessions to take your skills to the next level. Um, so it'd be great to see you there. Now, in the last few minutes, again, please keep the questions coming. Please don't worry if we don't get to it because we're gonna be following up uh, with a question and answer document for everybody. Um, so 
one question that I saw come up, which I thought was a great question, is, um, oh, one other thing. Yes, you'll be teaching the intermediate training October 16th through the 18th. So okay. you can, if you want to sign up for that, of course, information is on the MADCAP website. You can register online. It's a live instructor-led web-based course. So it's another great way to take your skills to the next level and, and get a little bit more Scott for three days. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so one question came in, which I thought was really interesting is, Tell us about what you're using for this great presentation and how did you, what, what are you using to present and how did you do that fun CSS thing at the very bottom? <laughs> I saw that a couple uh, times, so thought I'd throw that out there for everybody. It's all um, Flare based, so it's a Flare uh, top nav output. Um, I have the menu. So it's a, a Flare output, it, all this, the content was made in Flare, so that's how you know it would work. Um, and it's 90% CSS. There's a little bit of JavaScript in there, but probably, other than the translation thing, probably five lines of scripting or less. So I'm taking advantage of HTML attributes like content editable to make things editable. And it's just things I've created. This is typically how I, it's based on my test system that I use when I work with projects. It helps me quickly set up the CSS rather than using something like CodePen, which I think is kind of kludgy. Very good. Hopefully that helps. I know a few folks asked, uh, had some interesting questions about that, so that's great. Um, another question that has come in, um, kind of going back in the, in the beginning, uh, and, and you kind of touched on it, but when would you use max width slash height as a percentage. Okay, so the classic example of max width especially is for print, like I was talking about, because remember it's based on the container's width, and the cool thing about in print, that would be the width of the available content space, the body frame in your PDF output. So it figures that out. My example was, hey, it's eight and a half by 11 page layout. I got an inch on the left, inch on the right. So the space is six and a half inches. I don't have to figure all that out. I don't have to worry if I use a different page layout. I just say max width 100% for the image. And then boom, it'll squeeze down any images that are bigger than six and a half inches wide automatically. Um, height doesn't come up as often, but sometimes you say, hey, I, you know, the images are too tall for the piece of paper. But typically you're using one or the other. You get into, they kind of fight with each other because you want one to scale. So if you set both of them, you're going to get that weird funhouse mirror effect where it's stretched out or too wide. That's the classic use of it. Okay, good. I think we have time for one more. I think this is a good one and it comes up sometimes. How can I use CSS to wrap the text around an image? All right. Um, take, there's a couple ways to think about wrapping around it. So imagine that we had um, this image here. And if we look at the code, so there is a paragraph and then the image. Uh, we would need this image here to float. So if we had some text here, whatever. So we, if we put in enough text, then uh, we could set this image to float right. And if, so the text is going to start up here, go down, go down, go down, go down. And then eventually, when, when it's enough text, then it will start going under it. So that's, you know, the wrapping effect is it's going to start way up here. You have to have a whole bunch of text. It's kind of a tall image. But then eventually, when it's the, there's more text in the image, it will wrap. So it's usually using float left, which puts the image on the left and the text on the right, or float right, and the image is on the right and the text is on the left. So that's the classic way to do it. Very good. I'll write down, I'll make an example of wrapping text around the image using float and include it. Great. Well, I'm, I'm looking at the time. We want to be respectful of everybody's. Uh, many folks are on on uh, lunch hour, depending on where you are in the world. So, uh, we'll go I'll go ahead and wrap. But I, I just wanted to thank you, Scott, for this session. This was incredibly informative. I hope you all enjoyed it. Um, we're going to be not only providing a question and answer document, we'll be providing um, this as a resource for everybody. Correct, Scott? We'll be sending this 
uh, some of this information if folks want to use it in their own projects. Yeah, I'll send uh, all the code out to everyone. Or right. To you. Yes, so we will send it from the MADCAP side to everybody who's registered, so you can put some of these things in practice if you want and start learning and tinkering. But with that, I just want to thank everybody for taking the time to join us today. I do hope you found it helpful. I certainly did, and I uh, definitely want to thank you, Scott, for your time. So with that, we'll go ahead and wrap. Again, thanks for joining, and I uh, hope you all have a wonderful rest of the week and a good weekend, and we certainly hope to see you on the next session. Uh, here with Madcap. So thanks, everybody. Have a wonderful rest of the day. Great. Thanks, Jen. Thanks, Marissa. Thanks, everybody, for attending. Thank you.